more than 7 million people in the United States today have suffered a stroke. The good news is that there's hope, as well as support for stroke victims. You'll hear from a medical expert as well as a survivor himself on this week's Health Talk. We're up next. Today we're going to talk about stroke. Our guests are Dr. Daryl Story, he's a neurologist, and Don Steiner, an inspiring stroke survivor patient. And you guys know each other because you took care of the, uh, Mr. Steiner. Welcome. Yes. Welcome to Health Talk. It's Thanks. nice to have you. And Don, your story is a pretty dramatic story, maybe a little bit different than, than a typical stroke story, but why don't you start by telling us what happened to you? Well, um, it happened on Tuesday, no, sorry, Wednesday evening. I was home alone. Uh, working at my dining room table, I got up uh, to go down to another room, and as I was walking down the hall, I banged into the wall. My balance was a little off. I thought that was odd, but I didn't really make much of it. Mm -hmm. Went to bed, got up the next day, went to work. I had a conference call. Um, during that call, I realized that my speech was a little heavy and thick. Again, I didn't make anything of that either. Did, I, did other people comment to you about your speech? No, that day? I work alone, so I had okay. no interaction with anybody else. So uh, after that call, I've always prided myself on having decent penmanship, but after the call, I looked down the page of notes I had taken and I couldn't read what I had written. Uh. So I mentioned this to another guy downstairs I worked with, and he said, You really should get to the ER. So I did, and I uh, walked into Norwalk Hospital and I checked myself in. They brought me in the back and did some testing, and I thought I'd go out of there in an hour or two because I had things to do. <laughs> <laughs> but they decided to keep me, and uh, they brought me upstairs to telemetry and put me on a 24-hour monitor and 24-hour care, and I was up there for the next week. So did did they know that you were having a, what, was it clear at that point that you were having a stroke? Or I, don't, I don't know. They may have known, but I didn't know. But you didn't know. No, so. I had no idea. Yeah. Carol, how about his story? You see a lot of patients with stroke that you had the stroke program at the Norwalk Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, how typical or atypical is Don's story? Well, his symptoms came on in a fairly subtle way. Uh, and we, we often talk about stroke as something like a stroke. It comes on very, very fast, fast and it's easy to recognize, but uh, it's not always uh, easy to recognize. So what I like to tell people is anything that seems like it's malfunctioning in your body in some meaningful way, you know, that can yeah, be a stroke. It doesn't have to be a complete inability to speak or, or a complete inability to move a part of the body. And Don, you didn't really think about stroke at all during this first 24 no, hours, did no you? No idea what it was. Really, totally clueless about it. And, and I was, it was several days until I started to understand, speaking more with Dr. Story, what a stroke was. Yeah. Then it dawned on me how and this is bad. Hope one of the, the reasons for this show is to educate people at home what the symptoms are for a stroke so that they seek help rapidly because that can make a real difference, doesn't it? We'll get into that in the second segment. But Yeah, but what, it, what is a stroke? I mean, we know what it can do. We mm -hmm. heard Don's story and we'll hear more, I'm sure. But what, what happens inside the brain when you're having a stroke? So behind the scenes, when right. something is, is uh, happening to a person that can be, that can be uh, visualized, uh, it's a sudden problem with the blood supply to the brain, so the plumbing. Mm -hmm. It's a problem with the delivery of blood to a certain part of the brain. So the symptom that a person has depends on which vessel inside the brain is having a problem. So most often we call it an ischemic stroke, and what that means is that there's a blockage of the blood flow in the, in the little uh, blood vessel that goes to a certain part of the brain. And when that blood is not getting through and, and perfusing and delivering oxygen to that part of the brain, that part of the brain immediately starts to malfunction. Yeah, it's, it's really within minutes, within a minute or two, that the blood brain malfunctions. Exactly. It's not like other parts of the body which can sustain uh, lack of blood yeah, flow. I know that right. orthopedic surgery, they'll block down the blood flow to a limb for an hour or two or longer than that, whereas the brain can't tolerate a lack of blood flow for long at all. Not at all. And how about the, the, you talked about blockage of the two, but these, they can also leak and cause a stroke, right? The plumbing can leak. Right, so about 80 or 85% of strokes are the kind where the, the, the a blockage occurs, either by debris or some buildup of cholesterol inside the vessel, or a blood vessel can weaken and rupture inside the brain and sort of seep blood into that section of the well, brain. Well, how do you tell the difference? There is no way to tell the difference by looking at a person. Mm -hmm. the, the so only non-symptoms, you couldn't have said, 
from his symptoms that this was either a blockage or a bleed just from his symptoms at all? We couldn't have said it confidently. He did have symptoms that were quite subtle in the beginning, maybe, or at least to you, and sort of got, got worse over time. So a hemorrhage would not take quite that long to develop. But sometimes a hemorrhage causes a headache, but sometimes not. Right. So we, we like to say that the only way to know whether it's a hemorrhagic type stroke, blood in the brain versus an ischemic stroke, is a CAT scan. Yeah. And the only place you can get a CAT scan is in a hospital. So and the only for place example, you can get it rapidly is in an emergency department. That's right, in the emergency department. So we like to, to advise people if they have a symptom of a stroke, don't take aspirin because we're not even going to give you aspirin until we get that CAT scan. If you take a, a, a medicine that could thin your blood, it might not be the right treatment at yeah. that Now, we have some, uh, some radiographs, some MRIs and CAT scans to show what strokes look like in the brain. So I'd like to bring those up. By the way, uh, which kind of stroke did Don have? That was an ischemic stroke. There was a small well, blood a vessel where there was a blockage. Yeah. Well, tell us about this. So the MRI scan person with might, uh, mild right-sided weakness. So that would mean the left side of the brain. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to, I guess, to confuse people, the left side of the brain right. is the right side of the picture. Correct? Radiologists call mm -hmm. left, right, and right, left by convention. And so uh, this, this scan shows a lot of sort of a, a gray structure with some black in the middle. That's normal ventricles, whereas some fluid is. And if you can see, particularly on the, on the left lower image, there's some white discoloration and the one next to it. There's some white discoloration on that picture, which indicates, uh, which indicates injured brain. So a little part of that brain uh, matter is, is injured. And this is an MRI scan, which is extremely sensitive. So is that ischemic that we're looking at there? That is ischemic. That's right. Those cells that are in that area where those white blotches are are are, are abnormal at okay. that point, and they're showing up on the scan. And they're, they're damaged, Daryl, because they're not receiving oxygen. They're, they're, that, that is brain that's dying, essentially. That's right. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll bring up the next one. Now, this is, this is one image of a brain. We all see that big white blob. Right. So that subtle picture of that MRI scan with the little white dots on it could look kind of very similar to this person, uh, but uh, this is a CAT scan with a very large uh, globular uh, white area of abnormality, and on this CAT scan, white, white substances are, is blood, and mm -hmm. so this is a large clot of blood, a collection of blood on the inside of the brain, which also probably caused um, weakness yeah. uh, in the body. So this is what, Don, did you have a CAT scan when you went into the ED right away? Did they, did they do that while you were in the emergency department? Yes. Mm -hmm. So I guess somebody knew what was going on at that mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, let's have the next picture. So tell, tell, this is really sort of the bottom line we want our viewers to know. So tell, tell us right. about this. So the National Stroke Association has this campaign you know, to help us, it, it, to help the, the people in the community recognize uh, stroke symptoms. Mm -hmm. so, so FAST is the acronym, F-A-S-T, FAST. Uh, F stands for face, which is uh, if someone is acting like they may have a stroke symptom, look at their face, ask them to smile, and look for asymmetry. Uh, arm stands for arms. So if you ask them to hold their arms up, if an arm drifts down like this, in a, even in a subtle way, mm -hmm. that could be uh, a stroke symptom. Uh, speech, ask, asking them to repeat a phrase uh, and see if they can uh, speak properly is another common symptom of a stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, and T stands for time. So the stroke symptom has to be recognized quickly and action needs to be taken um, because we have only a very small window of time to try to give a medication that can actually reverse the symptoms of a stroke. So looking back, Don, uh, looking back at Don's case, when should he have called the emergency room, or when should he have gone to the emergency room? That's a good question. Because <laughs> <laughs> yours was more subtle than most. You didn't have the headache. Yes, yes. yes. But, you, but you noticed you bumped into the wall, and you said yeah. that was strange. Yeah. Did you notice weakness at that point? No. Or? And no. most people wouldn't have gone to the emergency room. I, I, I can say most yet. people would but say, I'm just went to the, I, the right. emergency room right. after bumping a wall, we'd have the lines around the block. Right. My favorite response to that really is, is, is the word malfunction. You know, if you think your body is malfunctioning in some way, that could be a stroke. The, it doesn't have to hurt. The first that would have been at the conference call, mm -hmm. that was definitely a malfunction. So how, how long would you say between the end of the conference call and when you looked at your handwriting and saw that maybe it wasn't legible, was there a long time lapse between that and the No, after hours? the call I looked down and realized okay. something was wrong. I, I still didn't do anything about it. That was in the morning, and it was only in the late afternoon I see. that I went mm -hmm. to the ER. Were you having more symptoms over the course of the day, thinking back that you could pinpoint no, or not really? No, no, no. And no headache? No. So what happened to you in the hospital? Well, uh, they put me in. I, I think uh, a lot of, for me, a lot of it was confusion. I didn't know what was happening. I wasn't sure. It was very scary. 
I, I had a discussion with a doctor about, you know, do not resuscitate. I thought, we're talking about this. This is supposed to be pretty serious. Right. So, I, you know, it was quite frightening. Uh, I was also angry because I didn't know what had taken place, but I knew I didn't like it. And I remember poor Dr. Story walking in one day, and I said, look, you know, two days ago I walked into this hospital and I checked myself in, and now I'm paralyzed on my right-hand side. I can hardly talk. You know, get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, somebody did something to you. <laughs> Thankfully, he didn't listen to me. He just kept taking care of me. And that's what made all the difference. Do you want to comment on that, Daryl? Because he, he did get worse after being in the hospital. Uh, what does that mean? Don's stroke was in a, a very tight part of the brain, a very uh, densely packed part of the brain where there's a lot of electricity uh, passing through. It's a, it was a major conduit where uh, the, the cortex of the brain, uh, all those cells out there were compressing into some very tight bundles of nerves that then directed all of that information to the opposite side of the body. The stroke was right in that area. Mm -hmm. So when those cells uh, started, to, started to malfunction initially and then die off, the symptoms uh, stabilized for a bit and then progressed more because like when you bump your arm or something, it swells. So the brain was collecting some fluid in that area and, and just a little more pressure and a little more fluid collecting in that area put more pressure on the, on the regions around it and, and made, made the, op the opposite side of the body, the right side, even weaker as the days went on. And unfortunately, we have nothing really to do for that cognitive process. Now Don, we're running out of time, but uh, right now your speech seem, seems quite good. Uh, we, uh, I think we can all tell there's a little bit of a slurring that there. I, you seem to walk, walk fine as you came in here. Do you have any weakness left on the right side? I, I do. I have trouble walking. I can't run. I can't jump. Um, the two things really are speech and walking. I have to work pretty hard when I talk. Otherwise, I get sloppy and it sounds like I've been drinking all day. <laughs> That's a little tough, but just those two things really. No effects on your memory or anything? No, well. it was never, I never had any cognitive issues at all. And how long did it take you to get back to this? Because I know it took, you went through speech rehab and physical. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say you never stop getting back, but the critical thing is the first six weeks after a stroke, they say that's the window for recovery. And boy, it, I believe it certainly is. You, you have to work hard and that's your chance to get better. And they're telling me we've run out of time, but can you, what message do you want people to have at home uh, from your experience? I, I would say just just be aware of how you feel and if something changes, you know it's changed. Don't ignore it. It's probably not going to go away. Do something about it. That's great and advice that's and that's all the time really we have important. for in this segment, unfortunately. So, so we need to you. take a break, but we will be back uh, after these messages and we'll talk a little bit more about the treatment of stroke and prevention of stroke. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Activity a day and eating well can help get your child healthy. So keep them active and eating well every day. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. That's letsmove.gov. moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Bring out the action hero in you. Fuel up right and get energized. Part of the greatest action movie ever. The first movie that puts you in the action. Show us how you train and eat like an action hero. Join in at actionheroalliance.com. 
The first 30 seconds are all I remember. My doctor told me I had cancer. When the shock was over, I met with a cancer specialist at Norwalk Hospital. We weighed all my options, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, even the latest clinical trials. Their Whittingham Cancer Center offered me personalized care, hope and leading cancer physicians. And I know great care. Besides being a cancer survivor, I'm also an ICU nurse and I chose Norwalk Hospital. Dr. Gerald Story and Don Steyer. Don was telling us about the stroke that he had about a year ago. Is that right, Don? Right, right. How, how are you feeling now? I feel pretty good, frankly. I, I, I do feel good. I, I've kind of changed my life. I go to the gym almost every day, and I've stopped smoking, which is a good thing, I'm told. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I feel pretty good, aside from, you know, these residual effects. Yeah. And, Daryl, your strokes, as we know, can be devastating, and I'm sure this has affected your life, despite the relatively good outcome. I mean, you could go a little bit into some of the things that we can do to prevent strokes. What are the things we should look at? Who's at risk, et cetera, et cetera? Well, there's, there's what we call modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. Uh, so, so Maybe we can bring that. We've got a graphic on that. Maybe we can bring that up as you go through some of those. So. That's things sure. you can change versus things that right. you can't change, Correct. like your genetics or your anatomy. Exactly. Yeah, so, so here we are. So um, getting older, um, uh, gender. Actually, th there is a there is a, a slight gender difference. I think men are a little bit higher risk than women, but more women in in the United States have strokes than men, for the reason that women tend to live longer, mm -hmm. and stroke is typically a disease of, of getting older. So, so they're more punished than for outliving us. For outliving men. Yes. Yes. We, we, we die off before we have our first stroke, more statistically. <laughs> so there are more women alive in, 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 at older ages. Are there yeah. ethnic differences uh, in terms of our stroke there, there are some ethnic differences that sort of disappear as, as, as uh, individuals age. So the African-American population has a higher risk of stroke uh, in, in, in a younger age. Mm -hmm. Now, you have high blood pressure pain. circled on this graphic. Well, why? This is, a, this is a slide from a talk I gave, and uh, that, that, that red uh, circle appears as I'm saying that high blood pressure is probably the most important risk factor for stroke that, that, that we can do something about with medications. Um, so not, not only puts you at risk for ischemic stroke because of gradual damage to blood vessels yeah. over the years, but also hemorrhages. And we have a lot that we can do about high blood pressure. Uh, just to list the others, heart disease, atrial fibrillation, which is getting a lot of ad attention on TV, high cholesterol, mm -hmm. diabetes carotid disease, a prior mini stroke, a TIA, and then the ones that we've talked about uh, all endlessly on this show, cigarette smoking, alcohol use, and physical inactivity. So we're right. going to come back to this set with us, but uh, tell us a little bit more about those. Those, those uh, lifestyle? Uh, yeah, lifestyle factors. changes. Yeah, well, how effective can one be in reducing your risk of stroke by paying attention to those? Well, things? we can be quite, quite effective. The absolute statistics are a little bit hard to pin down, but, but we know that over and over again, uh, studies, the studies show, well, we know, I think we all know about smoking as a risk factor for many, many things. Um, alcohol, um, you know, there is a, there is probably a healthy amount of alcohol. Um, you know, maybe a drink or for Your men. The French drink, right? The That's drink. right. <laughs> Maybe maybe uh, one at, at most two drinks a day for men, at most one drink a day for women, and some of the studies show that it might uh, give us a little bit of some, some cardiovascular protection. But after that, the, the curve starts to go up towards more hi uh, higher risk. Okay, where would done. you say, Don, where, yeah. right, where do you fit on the risk yeah, factor? When you see that <laughs> list, were there any of those that, that uh, involved well, you? Well, yeah, I was certainly an offender. I was a smoker and uh, didn't get that much activity and uh, yeah, I'll enjoy a drink, glass of wine, or yeah. so I was checkbox, you know, all three of them. Smoking probably, would you say, Daryl, out of the three behavior modification areas that you listed, would cigarette smoking be the primary cause? I for, would say, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Not, yeah. Only for, not only for stroke, but other But for diseases. some of the other diseases, right. So you've done yourself a great service by stopping, I think. The people, that, I think, I think they're beginning to learn. It was, when the dangers of smoking were first discovered, I think people thought of smoking and lung cancer, and that's right. that's mm -hmm. the danger everybody thought was there, and I don't think they realized the extent of other damage that smoking does to your blood, to vessels, blood vessels, to your heart, yeah. strokes, et cetera. But I think that's changing. I hope our viewers understand that smoking has this extraordinarily widespread array of uh, damage, which 
takes place later. So if you're a teenager smoking now, you're going to suffer when you're in your 50s and 60s. Right. Absolutely, except it's hard to make that connection when you're a teenager just starting Young and to experiment, sure. unfortunately. Did you start smoking at an early age? Not to put you on the spot with this, but uh, just... In my early 20s. Yeah. 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 Were you a heavy smoker, Don? Oh, about a pack a day. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a, a reasonable size habit. Would, right. would, did you stop right after the stroke? I didn't have much choice. <laughs> he <laughs> did. He did. He, he put me in the hospital for six weeks. I had no choice. Did you need a nicoderm patch while you were in the uh, hospital? You know, they did start me on those, did but they? very quickly I said, look, I don't need that anymore. I'm it, done. It passed very quickly. Yeah. It's yeah. too bad. We often see this, and I, you know, I personally, you, it takes a medical event to really jar you into action. Right. And I, I, I don't know how, how we get folks at home to realize that's it's beginning to be too late if you've done it, that you've really got to do that when you're younger, when you have the opportunity to, to prevent these things completely. Absolutely. You see so many people who have had a heart attack and then finally exercise, finally lose the weight. And it's, uh, yes, that's really important and it helps, but they, they probably could have prevented it if they had started the same thing sure. 10 years, 15 years ago. Now, Daryl, you mentioned time, and one of the slides we saw earlier, time was the T in fast. So right. how quickly you get to medical attention, getting to some of the treatment for stroke, why is time so important? Well, it's really of utmost importance. Those little cells that you saw on that MRI scan were already lost, and that happens within minutes. And you can't get those back. You can't get those back. Right. You can recover by recruiting other parts of the brain to fill in some of that activity. Uh, but we have one FDA-approved treatment for acute stroke, and that is TPA otherwise known as the clot buster. Uh, so the FDA has approved that to use only within the first three hours. So oh, we wow. have to recognize the stroke symptom, get to a hospital via 911, not by having someone drive you in or calling your doctor and waiting for a call back or taking a nap, a nap first. Not? I almost did, but no, a friend did. A friend drove you in, yeah. but you didn't get an ambulance right? No. And his symptoms had started even the yeah. day before, so we were kind of, uh, yeah, yeah, of well, well beyond yeah. that. So um, unfortunately, some people wake up with a stroke symptom, and if we don't know when they went to bed and you know, we don't know when it happened while they're sleeping, it, it puts us in a bind. But we need to know when it happened, and we can give that clot buster medication up to three hours, and in some people up to four and a half hours mm -hmm. after the onset of symptoms. Is there so any danger to, to giving it after that window, or is it just that it's ineffective? Um, both. Okay. Uh, but mostly there's, there's, there's significant danger. That scan that you saw of the, the, the blood clot is what can happen if you give TPA too late. It can I just see. make that damaged brain leak blood all over and cause a bad problem to be no, even worse. We're running out of time, but the use of aspirin or Plavix or some of these other platelet-active drugs, mm -hmm. can you just say a couple of words about that? Because I know a lot of people mm -hmm. with carotid disease will take platelets, platelet, anti-platelet agents. Right, so um, a blood thinning medication, uh, usually on the platelets, aspirin or clopidogrel, which is Plavix, is sort of a mainstay of stroke prevention. So, and it's, it's similar to heart attack prevention or stabilization of blood vessels in the legs. Uh, for, for many indications, antiplatelet medications are used to reduce the risk of stroke. So is Don on that for, for his stroke now? Mm -hmm. So Don? Yeah. No. And cholesterol lowering is, is, I think, becoming more and more uh, in, the, in the forefront too. I like to say to people, you know, who say, I had a stroke, but look, my cholesterol is pretty good. I say, you had a stroke. Your cholesterol, by definition, was not good enough. Exactly. <laughs> and we're aiming for lower and lower targets now, so that's something to be, to be aware of. Well, uh, that's... No, that's, that's, that's sorry. no I, I think that that's really great information to have, especially about the medication and the background of the different medications, why it's good to be on some, but to be very careful mm -hmm. when you're on um, platelet, yeah. especially platelet inhibitors um, sure. and things like that. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for. Uh, I, we do want to thank both of you for being on the show today. Yeah. And uh, we will come back for a health question, right? Question. So we'll have you help us, Daryl, so with this So when we come back, we will question. answer this health question. And right now, let's take a look at some of the upcoming events sponsored by Norwalk Hospital.
first 30 seconds are all I remember. My doctor told me I had cancer. When the shock was over, I met with a cancer specialist at Norwalk Hospital. We weighed all my options, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, even the latest clinical trials. Their Whittingham Cancer Center offered me personalized care, hope and leading cancer physicians. And I know great care. Besides being a cancer survivor, I'm also an ICU nurse and I chose Norwalk Hospital. Oops, yeah, sure. Let's go. Moms everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Works every time. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. This week's health question is, what is carotid artery disease? And we have our guests on the set who will uh, help us answer that, but I'll give an anatomy lesson first. Uh, the carotids are two big arteries that go up either side of the neck and feed the brain. So there are a couple of smaller ones in back, and so there are really four conduits of blood that go up to the brain, and these two in front often get disease. So Daryl, mm -hmm. uh, strokes and carotid arteries disease go together. Tell us about it. They, they do. Uh, there's a certain percentage, maybe 15 or so, 20% uh, of strokes that come from disease in the carotid arteries. The carotid arteries have a, a branch right here where they divide into two, uh, right in the, in the top of the neck there. and so. That tends to be a place where cholesterol starts to dig itself into the wall of that artery in a turbulent area. And it can collect and, and, and build up over the years to a point where there's just a plaque, uh, which is a visible uh, lump of, of cholesterol buildup so inside the wall of the artery. So it closes up the artery, basically. So as that's growing on the inside of the artery, it narrows the conduit through which that blood is, is flowing. So um, that can serve as a place where the blood uh, can, can pool and form little bits of debris and clots can form and travel up or it can get so tight and so narrow that no more blood can mm -hmm. get through there, and sometimes that will then lead to a, a symptom. And there are a number of stroke. treatments out there for carotid artery disease, in addition mm -hmm. to prevention, which are the things we've talked about. But let's say you have a, uh, a scan and, or an ultrasound, and it shows that you've got carotid artery disease. What can we do about it? Well, the first thing you're going to go on to what we would call medical management, which you'll look at whether there's a reason to be on aspirin, and a lot of times there will be. We're going to want to push down the cholesterol a whole lot. Uh, and there's, there are surgical options as well. Uh, so a surgeon can do an, a procedure called an end arterectomy where they expose the artery, clamp it above and below the area of clot, open it up, and, and just take, take the clot out with a, with a scalpel and, and restore the, the full blood flow there. And that can reduce the risk of a stroke happening someday. The statistics about who should get an end arterectomy, though, depend on the person, the age of the person, whether or not they've ever had a symptom of a stroke before, a TIA, a mini stroke, you know, something that was a warning sign mm -hmm. is the most important uh, uh, factor in deciding who should right. get an endoscopy. Yeah. Technically, you have some carotid artery stenosis or some plaque does not mean you need to have surgery does automatically. Not mean that you need to have surgery automatically. You need to talk about the statistics and yeah. your particular risk. Well, that's very right. helpful. Uh, Don, you. again, thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Daryl, uh, if you at home have a question you'd like to ask on Health Talk, please contact Vicki and me at Health Talk at norwalkhealth.org. Again, we would like to thank our guests today, Don Steiner and Dr. Daryl Story, for coming on the show. And see you next week on Health Talk and stay healthy. Stay well and bye bye.